many people as they age, even some basic activities can become more challenging. And I, that's when I adopted this lifestyle, that was one of the reasons why I did want to lose weight. And I also wanted hubby to come along and, and get healthy too. But I really was looking ahead and saying, I don't want to have that happen to me. I want to have a, a just a, a nice long lifestyle, long lifespan, but not just a lifespan, but a good health span. And so I figured, okay, I'll just change my diet to a whole food plant-based diet. And I did lose weight and I do feel so much more healthier and I do have a lot more strength and stamina, but that's not everything when it comes to aging and without these challenges that a lot of people are experiencing. So today Eileen's going to teach us how to age without decline, right? Yes. Yes. That's, that's my hope. And I realized I never asked, am I able to share my slides here? I forgot to ask that before. Oh, we... Yes, absolutely. We All will... right. So I will sign that, sign that in. in slides. There yes. we are. And, and so that's going to be a, uh, do you, are you, did you want to set that up? Yes. I apologize. No worries. I'm, not... I'm going to, I'm going to keep talking while you do that. And then I'll, okay. I'll look for that. It looks so, like I can't just share them off my computer. I've got to upload yeah. them. Okay. So, you know, while we um, are, are waiting for that, you know, maybe many of you that are watching or listening may know of people that are aging with decline, or maybe you're seeing some things happening. You know, a lot of the, the people that wind up in nursing homes are because they can't live independently. And, and gosh, when having a being on a plant based lifestyle, and my friends who are also on the lifestyle, we kind of joke with that because we say we don't want to be in a nursing home because then we won't get to eat the food that we are so used to eating. Oh, I can tell <laughs> you I think about that. I've worked in them. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So we're not, we're not, you know, it's not the other part of it that, that, that is the most worrisome about us. It's, it's where will we get the food that we're so used to eating the healthy food, because it doesn't seem like a lot of them serve very healthy food, but you know, you just want to be able to be independent for as long as possible. And there were just even basic activities, you know, going to the bathroom or cooking or, or even feeding yourself, or if you need any medication, being able to take care of that. And, that that was another reason why I adopted this lifestyle because I want a healthy li lifespan and I want not to be a burden on other people. And I want to maintain my independence for as long as possible. And that's why I was so excited that Eileen was going to be coming on the show because she's going to be telling us about, well, now you promote a, a healthy lifestyle as far as the, the diet goes, but that's not all that there is to it. Right. 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 Absolutely yeah. not. So and I've got these ready to share. Can you see them? Yeah, I can see them. So I'm going to, we're going to start off our uh, broadcast with our game of true or false. It's time for true or false on be green with Amy live answer true or false to Amy's questions in the comments below. And Amy will ask our guest for the expert answer. Okay, so the first question is, oh, and by the way, guys, if you type in the word false, true would be okay. But if you typed in the word false, social media, YouTube, whatever, when they see false, they think you're saying that something on here is not good. <laughs> so just type in T or F, and that'll make it easier to type anyway. Okay. So T or F. Loss of muscle and bone density are a normal part of aging. So T or F. Green Warriors, you type in your guess. And Eileen, while they're doing that, go ahead and tell us what the answer is. Okay, so I'm going to tell them the answer as they're typing the answer, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> it is a myth. It is not true. Yeah. See that? And we're going to learn more about that uh, with your presentation too. All right. So the next one is T or F. It is normal to lose stability as you age. T or F. Okay, Eileen, and what's mm -hmm. your answer? And again, that is another myth. It is not true. Well, that's good to hear. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Jesse T said, oh. <laughs> so we're already learning something. I'm learning things too. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Okay. And then the last question, T or F, 
joint pain is inevitable as you get older. Okay, Eileen, what's the answer? And again, ding, 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 it is not true. That is a myth. Yes. So I'm excited to hear that th those are all myths because mm -hmm. I certainly don't want that to be a part of aging. And I, I mean, I have a friend that is having some, he's in his seventies, I think, and he's having some issues and his, it's a shame. His physician said, well, what do you want? You're 73. And that That's should, somebody should never say that, right? That That's should what never we hear. be said. We hear you are getting older, you know, what do you expect at your age? You know, there's all the jokes about the golden years when people have created these long, elaborate poems about how awful it is to get older. Right. And it's all it's it's what we've done prior to hitting that age. It's not the age itself. And I know we have limited time today and I've really tried to condense my slides to the point where I'm going to have time to teach people how to train to age well, um, you know, some important facts. But. But the bottom line is so much of what we believe about aging is a myth. And when I say that, and I've even got it in my slide, a myth is it's not a myth because it doesn't happen. Because a lot of the times a myth is, you know, like a unicorn or, or a Pegasus, <laughs> right? Those are myths, right? It's a myth because it doesn't have to happen. We believe it has to happen. And that's the myth because it doesn't have to. So, and as, as I commonly tell people, you know, just because something is common doesn't mean it's normal. Disease is abnormal functioning, but because it happens to so many people, we think it's normal, but it's not, it's common, mm. but it's not normal, right? So aging with decline might be common, but it's not normal. It's not how our bodies are designed to age. So, yeah. Well, I'm so excited that you are telling this because we, we want to look forward to that. And we want to have that in our control and not that you're just going to give us a presentation, but you have a wonderful gym and you're going to go downstairs later and you're actually going to demonstrate things that we can do. So I'm really excited. So why don't we get started then? Okay. All right. So you tell me when you're ready for me to move the slides. I'm not sure what you're seeing. Okay. So hang on a second. I'm going to put you. Okay. And can you see my slides? Because I'm saying that I'm sharing. Oh, here we go. This is what I want to share. This here. I'm hoping I've got the right, the right setting here. I apologize, Amy, if I'm sounding like I don't know what I'm doing. Can you see my slides? Can everyone else see my slides? Because I'm not sure what you can see. Oh, there they are. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You were probably working on buttons and I was getting panicked. I was missing something technology wise. I always joke and say that the um, everything I know about technology, I learned by making every mistake possible. So uh, while I manage a lot of technology, I'm, I'm not always an expert at it. So here we go. So um, I'm going to talk about three common culprits that can lead to chronic pain, which are commonly seen as we age, but more and more younger people, as you and I were talking before, you started the show that we're seeing younger people experience these things, you know, just like diabetes, right? Type two onset diabetes used to not happen until people were middle-aged or older. And now it's happening to younger people. They used to call it adult onset diabetes. Now they call it type two because it's happening to younger people. So there's a problem going on in our world, right? But I'm going to focus on, on aging today and common culprits of, of movement. So it really is a myth that we age with decline. It doesn't have to happen. Um, it does happen commonly, but it doesn't have to. So hopefully I'm gonna dispel some of these myths. And as I said earlier, before I even started the slides, a myth is a widely held um, but false belief or idea. Now it's a false belief that we are designed to fall apart once we hit some magic age and it's the pharmaceutical industry's job to hold us together until we go below ground, right? That's a myth. It's, we're not intended to suffer and not be able to move as we get older. We're not intended to, um, we're not designed uh, to kind of just lose our independence as the years go on until we end up in a wheelchair, till we end up in a nursing home. One of my favorite things to say is nobody ever set a goal to go to a nursing home, but it happens by default. 
we have to know what to do actively to prevent it, right? In order to maintain good life or regain it if we've lost it because of an injury or an accident or an illness. And uh, the body has a remarkable ability to do um, on a cellular level, everything it's designed to do, no matter how old we are. Some processes might slow down a little bit, but it's not what people think it is. So let me get started here. So um, I love this because, you know, I, I'm, I'm 64, right? And it's weird being the same age as old people. I, I just want to say that because I, I have people contact me all the time who are younger than me and they say, well, at my age, you know, it's, it's, I have this and I have that, but you know, that's, that's to be expected at my age. And I'm, and I just smile and I, I'm like, I'm older than you and I don't have any of that. And yes, I thank God that I don't, but I work with him, not against him. I know the right things to do and I don't have to live a perfect life right? We don't have to be perfect. That just stresses everybody out. That just puts us in that sympathetic nervous system overdrive of fight or flight. Oh my gosh, if I don't do everything perfect, I'm going to fall apart. But if you know the right things to do and you practice them consistently, the odds are really in your favor to age really stinking well. I plan to age to at least 112 and be really stinking happy about it right? I always joke, no diapers are drooling for me. I, I'm going to have independent life. I'm going to be vibrant. I'm going to be productive. And I'm going to be a positive impact on society as long as I'm taking breath, as long as I'm above ground. And everybody can have that. You know, God forbid an injury or an accident, that's a whole different story. But for the most part, we have a huge impact on our future, but we have to know what to do. So look at these pictures, you know, what's old and what's normal? The person on the right, um, I think her name is Betty Jean. She's 88 years old and she just finished a marathon. And I believe she was in her 60s when she started doing marathons. She might have even been in her 70s. I forget the details. But and then the, the woman down on the bottom right, she's in her 80s. She's a yoga instructor in Australia. And look at what she can do. So why do we think the pictures on the left are what is normal. That's not normal, it's abnormal. Just like I said earlier, disease is abnormal functioning. Declining as you age is abnormal. So I, I always like to start with this. You wanna be informed so that you can make better choices for better results. If you don't know these things, you're, you're gonna make different choices, right? So hopefully after today, you're gonna to be armed and dangerous, right? You're gonna you're going to know how to age really, really well. So, and again, you know, we live in the land of litigation. I am going to be teaching movements. I don't want anyone to think that, you know, I'm doing PT with them or this is medical advice or treatment or any of that stuff. Anything I mention, this is simply for information and education. And so it's kind of a proceed at your own risk thing. Um, I will be teaching and mentioning modifications for people who have limitations or may have some issues going on, but I don't know what's going on in your world. So um, you need to use common sense and wisdom and discernment, right, in, in what you do with what I demonstrate in a little bit. So I like to define words so we're all on the same page. When you define aging, it's considered the process of growing old. So let's define the word old. And that is as if or appearing to be far advanced in years. So as you can see here, it says as if or appearing to be far advanced in years. And, and so, okay, can we, can we make a difference there, right? Now, there's tons and tons of research. I mean, I've presented on this stuff. I was at a conference in November where I presented in some detail on these different theories and, and on the science. You know, I went deep into to cellular senescence and genomic instability and telomere attrition and all this fun stuff. But, it, you know, there's so much research, but ultimately there has never been a study that has clearly defined why aging happens as far as decline why someone loses their ability to move well, to, why they lose their strength, why they lose their stability, why they, they, they lose all of these things. There's no clear cut science that explains it, right? I, I, I'm showing my age, I'm thinking of Lucille Ball, explain it to me, Lucy, right? Nobody can explain it to us, no matter how much research they've done. So, so this is what I say, and this should pop up. There's this. Hold on. Let me overthink this. Right. 
let's go so deep into the science that we can't see daylight. But when it comes down to it, the bottom line is it's so simple. It's right in front of our face. We aren't moving what right and we aren't eating right. Movement is huge. If I start to get weak, handing me more broccoli isn't going to make me stronger. If we could get stronger in the kitchen, nobody would have to go to the gym. Nobody would have to get off the sofa, right? We could just sit and stuff ourselves with steamed green beans. And my favorite is Trader Joe's green beans and cauliflower mixed. And I love the pot, pot liquor, the broth from it. But that's not going to make me stronger. It's going to fuel my body so that I can do good things. And it's going to help with any disease processes. It's going to help with all kinds of things. I mean, PCRM did a whole conference on um, brain health and nutrition, right? So odds are, I mean, I I've seen a lot of my relatives who, who end up with some dementia or potentially Alzheimer's. There is a difference between the two. A lot of those people lived on a lot of sugar, a lot of really terrible diets. It's rare. I mean, and I saw this, you know, I did home care for a decade. I've worked in nursing homes and long term rehab facilities and and acute care hospital settings and um, orthopedic outpatient settings. I've worked in about every setting there is in my profession. But what I've seen with the elderly is those who are 100 years old and they're still home and independent and doing everything that gives great quality of life. Guess what? They like to drink water. They've been active. They enjoyed exercise their whole life. They've got bowls of fruit on the counter. Someone else's home I go into, they might only be in their 60s or 70s. They're wheelchair bound. They've got a medication list a mile long. They've got di disease diagnoses through the roof. Their quality of life is horrid. And their kitchen table or their dining room table or the kitchen counter is loaded with junk donuts and pastries and cookies they don't like water they will they'll only drink you know soda or coffee or juice or whatever so i saw this you know for years in my profession i saw the difference so yes nutrition plays a massive role but nutrition will not make you stronger or prevent aging without decline physically and that's what we're talking about here today so um I, I like this next slide right so aging and decline which came first and i love this joke i found this somewhere and i loved it i bought a chicken from one website and an egg from another i'll let you know which came first so what happens when we start to decline as we age do we have that mindset that says oh i better slow down oh you know you got some aches and pains from doing something that you were able to do your whole life now you think well i guess it's because i'm getting older everybody says i need to slow down that i shouldn't do that anymore that i you know it's all about age and and i can't do this and i can't so which came first did the decline happen because you stopped doing it and a lot of older people will admit that they really don't exercise regularly they don't make that you know, oh, but it hurts. It hurts. Or I was told not to. Or now I'm not saying if anybody was told, you know, medically advised not to do something. I'm certainly not saying to go against that. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. But if you've stopped moving because you think age is what's requiring you to stop moving, you know, which came first, right? It wasn't that you got older that you declined. It's that you stopped doing it, right? So, I'm going to talk a little bit about why you must exercise and you might be surprised at this fact physical act inactivity is the fourth leading risk factor for death globally yeah right behind high blood pressure smoking and and high blood sugar physical inactivity fourth leading risk factor for death globally so that means people are dying before they're supposed to because they're not moving it has a huge impact on your future right Another reason why you must exercise, and as I said, diet alone is not enough. You must get exercise. You cannot strengthen in the kitchen. You've got to move your body, but you have to know how to move it properly. And there's a lot of, of misunderstanding and confusion about what proper movement actually is. There are a lot of very well-meaning but misinformed practitioners, uh, movement specialists, who are advising things that is not authentic human movement or function. And that's why people end up getting hurt 
or they go to the gym and they use those machines that are horrible, which I won't get off on a tangent on. I might mention a little bit about later if that, you know, we can do a Q&A. But it's really important that you understand how to move your body. And if you move your body right and you know how to lengthen and load and tweak in and tweak out, which I'll explain in a little bit, you can almost erase pain with movement. You can notice that if your knee hurt, now when you move this way, the knee doesn't hurt anymore. Wow. So yeah, and, and we'll get into that. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, and, and a little bit more data here, right? 6% of deaths globally result from physical inactivity. So that means six out of every 100 people are dying because they're inactive. And then over 3 million preventable deaths each year. And this is from the World Health Organization. This isn't my opinion, right? There's a couple of slides here on research. Research, and I could I could paper my, my office walls, my whole house with research that talks about these topics, but I just picked a couple to, to share with you. Seniors who are more physically active are at lower risk for walking difficulties and other movement problems. So movement is the answer. Not moving is never the answer. You just need to learn how to move if movement is painful, right? And then this one, exercise increases the size of the hippocampus and improves memory. And that's because of brain derived neurotrophic factor. That's a chemical in the brain. And your hippocampus is where your short term memory sits. So if you struggle to remember something from yesterday or this morning, guess what? You might be low on BDNF. Exercise increases, right? Because it, it increases the BDNF. It increases your, your brain's production of that. Also, if you are under an extreme amount of stress, which who isn't in our world, especially the last three years, there's something called cortisol, which is essentially a stress chemical that your body releases. And cortisol is well known for beating up your hippocampus. So if you're struggling to remember simple things from this morning or yesterday, it doesn't mean that you have an onset of dementia. It means that you may have too much cortisol surging through your body because of stress. You may be in a, a sympathetic nervous system overload, which means you're in a fight or flight, you know, you're running from the bear kind of a thing. And it could just be from a whole day of when you get up, you know, you're, oh, you're late for work. Your boss is going to yell at you. You're, you're going to be late for your kids thing. You're going to this, you're going to that. You're all those things, learning how to manage those things and get yourself back into a parasympathetic heal and repair mode is key, especially if you're struggling with short-term memory, right? It's not necessarily age. It could more than likely simply be stress and and your, your, your fight or flight mode is like the gas pedal. Your healing and repair mode is like the brake. If all of you know who've driven a car, you can't work both pedals at the same time. It doesn't work. Your body can only be in one mode or the other, right? So that's important, okay? All right, I know I got off the tangent of exercise, but I think it's important for you to understand this, especially in today's world. So this is important before you start, right? Check and make sure. And these are just kind of general guidelines it doesn't mean that you should not do this. It means use common sense, know what your limitations are. I'm certainly not gonna have anybody doing any aerobic activity activity today, but you know, you know, if your knee is bone on bone, you're not gonna wanna grind your knee during a movement, that kind of thing. So you know what's going on in your world, right? But you, you wanna be wise and use discernment when you start doing things. If you're not sure what to do um, by yourself independently, then seek an expert who can help you get started safely, right? I had a gentleman who was 86 years old. His wife brought him to the clinic because he was now needing help to get up out of the chair. And she said that he used to walk to the corner store every morning to get the paper. He stopped doing that. He stopped moving. And now he needed help just to get up. And he's sitting in the chair listening to her tell me this stuff. And he looks up at me and he says, don't you think at my age I should be allowed to rest? And I looked down at him and I said, if you want your wife to dust you off once a day, well, he was kind of surprised at my answer, but within, I think it was two weeks, it might've been three, he was leg pressing over 200 pounds. He safely regained his ability to get up out of that chair like a shot. We didn't injure him. We did all the right things, but it doesn't matter how old you are. You, you have a cellular response in your body. You can increase bone density and you can increase muscle size and strength no matter your age. As long as you're above ground, as long as you don't have some life wasting horrible terminal disease your body can improve it does not matter how old you are it is never too late i've had people 100 years old in the parallel bars doing squats so it, it doesn't matter you know they used to joke and call me the sergeant 
in the, in the rehab center, but I didn't hurt people. I treated them according to their ability, not their age. Right. And I knew like a, a woman who was, um, I don't remember she was, she was 88 and she had fallen off a ladder cleaning the snow off her roof. And they were giving the, her these silly seated exercises. She was going to go home and, and run a farm. This woman needed exercises that was going to make sure she stayed safe and independent as long as she was above ground. And so that's what I gave her. She was a happy camper. Right. So so don't think you, you don't want to be treated based on your age. You want to be treated based on your abilities. You want to start where you're successful and build on that. Right. Success means no pain, no loss of balance or stability. And you're safe while you're doing things and you can do it repetitively. And then you build on that. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. OK, so um, I'm going to kind of focus on this for the last few slides and then we'll get to the movements. Um, this is a myth, this is a myth about aging that loss of muscle and bone density are just part of aging. This is not true. It could not be more of a myth. And this is Cy Perlis. Now he's 91 years old in this picture. And this was back in 2013. He did a bench press and he set a new world record for his age group. He bench pressed 187.2 pounds. Now, prior to that, the world record for his age group was 135 pounds, and that had been since 2005. So you're talking eight years, that record had been held at 135, and he blasted through at 187 pounds. Now, I shared this at a conference, and I asked um, in the conference if there was any man there who could bench press 187 pounds, and not one of them raised their hand. So that's a lot of strength. He was 91. Now, here's, here's the best part about this. He didn't start weightlifting until he was 60 years old, and he didn't start competing until he was 86. So, you know, we think, oh, once we hit this magic age, whatever we've got in our head, this mindset, which is all lies from the pit of hell, you know, oh, I'm 60. I guess I can't do this. Oh, I'm 65. I guess I can't do that. No, it's not true. Okay. So, yes. Bone and muscle loss can happen, but they're, they're completely related to exercise and diet. Now, unless you have some, again, horrible disease. Now, there are some medications that will, will destroy muscle. There, there are some medications that are really well known, and I won't sit here and list them all off. Um, but you have to know if you're on any medications, look at the side effects. There are medications that are just horrible for these things, right? So you want to be, make sure you know that. But for the most part, if you're putting the right things in your mouth and you're, and you're moving, you're not going to suffer bone loss and muscle loss to the point where you age with decline. You won't. Now, there is a natural um, decrease in bone density over the years uh, for women, but that's because you're no longer childbearing. And you don't need that much density in your bones because you're not going to bear children. But there's really no relationship between that, that loss of density and fracture risk. Uh, you know, I mean, the United States Preventative Service, the United States Preventive Services Task Force, there's, there's say that three times fast, has designated that, you know, the, the, the bone density and the fracture risk don't line up. Right. So there are other countries where their, their bone density is a little bit lower and they have almost no fracture risk. So a lot of that has to do with diet. And then, of course, if you're really sedentary, because bones weaken when you don't use them and they strengthen when you do. So that's what matters most. Right. And the same with muscle. So. Uh, so here's something called sarcopenia. You may have never heard of this before. You may have heard of it. On the left here is healthy muscle mass. And on the right, this is sarcopenia. So let me explain this just briefly. This is the thigh bone. So this is if you just sliced across the thigh and you look down. So this is the thigh bone. This is the femur. And what you're seeing here is, you know, hamstrings and quads, right? And some of the glute, depending on how high up they did the slice here. And you can see there's lots of muscle here. Lots and lots of muscle and the green lines, that's that's blood supply, right? So, you, so you've got and very little fat uh, around this muscle and almost no fat within the muscle bounds. Look at this leg. It's the same exact circumference, but look at how much more fat there is and how much less muscle. 
This is a leg that struggles to go up and down stairs, to get in and out of a car, to squat, to get something out from under the sink. This is a leg that struggles with function because it has lost strength. It has lost muscle mass, but because of an increasing con a concomitant increase in fat mass, there's no loss in size. So this person doesn't think they've lost anything, but they have, right? So, and this is related to aging and I'm going to show you a couple of statistics, but it's not because you age that it happens. Depends on what study you look at. I used to think it was the last study I'd looked at said 45 years old. Now they're saying as young as 35 years old. And I think it's because of all the computer work we do nowadays. Um, but muscle mass declines one to two percent per year. This is what's seen in the general population. Now, you don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying this is normal. I'm saying this is commonly seen right? After the age of 60, it can accelerate up to 3% per year. No regular strength training. You'll lose four to six pounds of muscle per decade. Yeah. If you're not doing any strength training, right? And, and this is from Harvard. This wasn't my opinion. So this is what happens with diet. If you're consuming a lot of animal protein, because the protein has carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, you have all this nitrogen. Carbohydrates don't have nitrogen. They just have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? So if you're consuming all this animal protein, what happens is you get all this excess nitrogen that your body has to metabolize. It ends up leading into having uric acid and sulfuric acid enter the bloodstream, but because your pH of your blood has to be between 7.35 and 7.45, because if it's not, it's incompatible with life, your body wants to buffer the acids and how it does it is it removes calcium from bone stores to buffer the acid. And then once it's done doing that, the calcium ends up either being deposited in the kidneys like kidney stones, or it's it, you literally urinate your calcium into a toilet. So as I, as I kind of bluntly say to people, you can pee your bones down the toilet and you don't wanna be doing that, right? So if you're eating a high animal protein diet, a high acid load diet, and you're not moving, you are a ripe candidate for osteoporosis. Absolutely. And, and a high fracture risk, right? So when it comes to strength training, it does build muscle and it does build bone density. There are studies that show it doesn't matter. You can be in your 80s and 90s and increase your bone density. Uh, now you have to be careful if you do have very fragile bones, if you do have, if you have lost a lot of bone density, if you are considered osteoporotic, you have to be careful the movements you do. You don't want to stress those bones because you are at a high risk of fracturing a, a you know, a vertebrae or a rib. Um, just opening a window can break a rib on somebody who has osteoporosis. So you do have to be careful. But if you do not have osteoporosis, you know, you want to make sure you don't get it. So strength training is key as well as not eating a high acid load diet, right? And, um, and if you do have osteoporosis, work with an expert who can help you safely do the right things. And hopefully, I'm, I'm assuming if you're watching this show, you are eating a whole food plant-based diet. Um, but if not, I hope this encourages you to at least investigate that option for your life. And weightlifters do have higher bone density. They do, very much higher. And that's because bones grow according to the stresses placed upon them. And they weaken when there's no stress, right? Don't, don't use it, you lose it. it that, that's very, very true of bone density. Okay, so we've only got a couple more slides here. These are movements that will reestablish strength and also help to address chronic pain movements. And I'm gonna show you some things downstairs. I'm gonna go into the three common culprit areas, um, but I wanted to kind of get you thinking with this. Mediocrities, I came across this saying and I just laughed out loud but then I realized it's not so funny because a lot of, you know, eh, my, my daughter, my youngest daughter was, was famous for saying meh, right? The younger people, meh, that's good enough. Well, some of the things you're doing, you might think, eh, that's good enough. Not necessarily, right? I mean, we know if, if you're in this group, you probably already know this, taking the skin off your chicken is not going to improve your health, right? So, you know, that, and everybody thinks, you know, the white meat is, the, in, in, I mean, all the, the things that we used to think about food that we know better now, 
well, hopefully after this, you're going to know better about movement. The things that you used to think you're going to know better now, right? So I loved this quote when I came across this, this, this uh, picture online doing a search. I loved it. Mediocrity. It comes from the Latin word medius, meaning middle, and ochris, meaning rugged mountain. So it literally, if you translate it, it means to settle halfway to the summit of a difficult mountain. It's a compromise of your abilities and your potential. You can think of it like a negotiation between the drive to excel or succeed or achieve and the biological urge to settle for the most comfortable option because it's a lot more comfortable sitting in your recliner than it is to get up and do some squats, right? So um, yeah, don't settle for mediocrity in your life. You have the ability, you have the potential. If you are a human being and you do not have a terminal disease, the odds are in your favor, you can achieve this. And it might happen in a time span that shocks you, it's so fast. It doesn't take long when you're doing the right things, okay? So I'm hosting, I, I just wanna quickly share this and, and I know that Amy's gonna have links for you guys to access, but I am doing a reverse aging bootcamp, it's free. It's a five day boot camp. It starts the 30th, which is the last Monday of this month. And you can go to that link there and sign up. I think Amy's gonna also have a link for you to access. It's absolutely free. And it is, it is my goal that you will move like you're 10 years younger by the end of the five days. That's my goal. So, and I, you know, my mom was Irish German. She's, you know, she says, don't you make a promise or say, you know, anything you're going to do that you don't do, you better follow up, you know, and, and, and be honest with what you're saying. So, and that's my goal. I am going to do my darndest to make sure that happens during those five days. So, but you've got to show up and do the work, right? It's not going to happen if you're just sitting at your computer. I'm going to teach lots of movements. I'm going to teach lots of workouts. I'm going to talk about um, other aspects of aging that are myths that we can, we can blow out of the water, right? So by the end of the boot camp, this will be you. Underestimate me. That'll be fun, right? Yeah, you can do this. Now, I'm not going to have you get down on the floor and do planks, just so you know, during, during the, the boot camp. But we are going to be doing some things that are going to radically alter your ability to move and, and your quality of movement. So these are the three things I'm going to talk about. This is my last slide, and then we're going to go downstairs. Um, or I'm going to go downstairs, and you're going to watch me down there. Everything is connected to everything else. And this is one of the things that um, literally just makes my skin crawl when people are treated like a body part when they walk through the door. So if you've ever been to it and, you know, I'm not bashing my profession because people can only teach what they know. They can't teach what they don't know. But if you saw a PT and you had a knee problem and all they did was look at your knee, then you, you, you were not addressed the way that's going to resolve your problem. The knee is just a very simple hinge joint. It only bends one way, like the hinge on a door. Yes, there's a little bit of side to side and a little bit of turning motions, but for the most part, it's just flexion extension. And if all they did was look at your knee and give you exercises like sitting and straightening your knee against resistance, then they did you a disservice because they didn't look at your hip. They didn't look at your ankle because those two body parts above and below that knee radically impact what's going on with that knee. So you have to be seen as a whole person. You are a whole body that walks through the door. You have to be a, assessed from your nose to your toes. And I can do a full body assessment in three plane function in less than a half hour with someone. And that includes teaching them movements. So we're not talking, you know, it doesn't take 14 hours. We're not going to, when you get manual muscle tests, you know, oh, I'm going to test your bicep. Oh, let's see what's going on with the short head. Let's see what's going on with the long head. Can you supinate? Can you, that's nonsense. That's not, that's not functional assessment right? And I don't, again, I don't mean disrespect to anyone, but it's so important that you realize that everything's connected to everything else and how you move has to understand that to the T so that you know, when you have shoulder pain, oh, guess what? My trunk is not rotating or my hip is not adducting on that side or my ankle is really unstable. That's why my shoulder is bothering me. And I know you might think, what? How, what does an ankle have to do with a shoulder? <clears throat> I'll give you a great story real quick. Had a 22-year-old football quarterback from the local college come in with a diagnosis of shoulder tendonitis. I, he was rock-solid muscle from his, from his head to his toes. He didn't have a weak 
muscle on his body. He was like a boulder and he had full range of motion. So I knew right away, I threw that out the window. His shoulder's not the problem. I asked him to show me because he was a quarterback. And he said when he'd have his three hour, three man throws, he would have to stop early because his shoulder and his elbow would bother him so much he couldn't keep throwing the football. So I asked him to show me how he threw a football. He threw the football. Right away, I said, okay, how many times have you sprained your ankle? And he looks at me and he says, um, I kind of roll out on them during practice sometimes and I have to walk off the pain. His ankle was so unstable that he had a delayed release of the ball, which was stressing the shoulder. I never touched that young man's shoulder. Three or four visits, I remember exactly, it was like three or four. All we did was work on giving him stability exercises for his ankles to get them back to performing properly. And he could do full three hour, three man throws with that football with no shoulder symptoms whatsoever. I never touched his shoulder. So everything's connected to everything else and you have to know this, right? So um, looking back at this slide, you'll see the three common culprit areas are your ankles, your hips, and your trunk. And you can see that ankle picture down there below. I wanted you to see this. And you don't have to memorize inversion, eversion, any of that stuff. But when you're, so this is somebody's right foot. So if they bend their right foot so that their ankle goes out a little bit and their toes kind of come in, that's inversion of the heel, right? It's not the forefoot, that's a different term. It's of the heel bone, but I wanted you to see from the front of the foot so it made sense to you. And this is when the, the, the heel is in neutral. And then this is when the foot goes this way, the heel goes into eversion. Now, the reason that's important is when that inversion and eversion happens at the right time, the correct way, everything above in the body is kind of switched on. It's sort of like this chain reaction that happens going up the body. And if that inversion and eversion isn't happening at the right time or happening at all, some people who have a history of an ankle sprain, they may not have inversion, they may not have eversion, they may be lacking dorsiflexion, and so it's not happening. So that means all the timing of those muscles that go from the ground up is not happening properly either. So it can lead to knee pain, hip pain, low back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, right? And then we've got your hips. So your ankles have to be fully mobile and fully stable. Your hips have to be fully mobile and fully stable. Your hips are the second most mobile joint in the body with your shoulder being the most mobile. And if it's not fully mobile in all three planes of motion, then it's going to wreak havoc on your knees, your low back. I mean, I often kind of joke and, and say tongue in cheek, ignore the low back to fix the low back pain because almost always it's not the low back. It's the hips or the trunk that that's the problem. And then moving up to the trunk, do you have full rotation in both directions? Do you struggle to turn to back up the car when you're driving? If you struggle to do that, guess what? Your trunk is not fully mobile. And if you, and, and the same thing with your shoulder, part of the trunk is if you go to lift your arm up, if you get to just 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 sit and kind of slouch a little bit and lift your arm up and it'll only go so far i can't even push it past here because i'm slouching a little but when i sit up nice and straight look how much more motion i have right that's because in order to get that last few degrees of full shoulder flexion your thoracic spine your trunk has to extend at the top and a lot of us because of spending our lives like this for however how many decades that thoracic spine does not extend at the top. And so now you've lost motion there. And so now every time you go to do something overhead, you know, maybe you're a younger person and you do sports and you want to, you know, you play volleyball. And maybe when you, maybe when you serve the volleyball, you do an overhand serve versus an underhand. Every time you do that, right. You're, 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 that shoulder is not properly aligned because your thoracic spine is not extending. And my profession's notorious for, you know, getting somebody on a treatment table and just trying to get those last few degrees of flexion without even knowing, like I said, you can't teach what you don't know, without even knowing that they need to make sure the top of the thoracic spine is extending. What's T1, T2, T3, T4 doing? Will they extend or are they lacking that motion? So, so you have to know everything's connected to everything else. All right, so I believe that was my last slide. Yeah, 
and uh, I will stop sharing. And now I don't know if anybody wants to ask a question before I go downstairs or. Yeah, we have a couple of questions for you. So Marion wanted to know osteopenia, say yes. to weights. Yes, osteopenia. So osteopenia, and remember, I'm not giving medical advice here. Just yes. want to be clear. Osteopenia is a term, and I, and I did I did a, a research paper on this for getting my diploma in, in nutrition education. So osteopenia was a term that was coined by researchers because they, they all met, I believe it was in Madrid back in the 70s. They, they met to determine, because they got all these experts from around the world who were studying osteoporosis, and they were trying to figure out, okay, wh where do we say on the line of the bone density that it's osteoporosis, and before that line, it's not. So what the researchers did was they coined the term osteopenia, which meant they're kind of getting close to the line and they could use that term in research. It was never, ever meant to be a medical diagnosis or to be treated medically. That was not the original reason for the term. And it is normal for a woman to lose some bone density as she ages because she's no longer of childbearing years but it's not normal to lose bone density and be at risk of fracture, right? So a lot of the things that we, we've we learned about that, and I mean, we I could do, if ever you wanted me to come back, I'd be happy to talk in more in detail about it. You this. have to come back because there's a lot of unanswered questions in my yeah, brain, and I'm yeah, sure yeah, yeah. people- But osteopenia, yeah. you know, just make sure, I, you know, I always caution people, check with your healthcare provider. Now, of course, we do have to say your healthcare provider can only, say what they know yeah. right so so there's that but ideally if you're 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 not at risk of fracture if you're doing the right things and you're moving body your body the right way the the, the odds are you will increase your bone density and of course if you're eating properly and not peeing your bones down the toilet you know there's that too right and and anybody that's not doing weights of course they can start off I've seen these ankle weights, but I wouldn't say to put them on your ankle, but you could put them around your wrist maybe, and they're adjustable. So you could start off with a quarter pound. Right. Well, what I often tell people is start off with just body weight. Learn how to move your body properly. Learn how to do three plane training without weight, mm -hmm. where you're confident, you're fully mobile, you're fully stable, then start adding some weight. Yeah, we've had Angela Fischetti on quite quite often. I'll do exercises along with her, but I can't do them in a way that I would do it if I was not hosting. And so I'll just do this. Yeah. I have the weights in my hand and I'll just do this. And boy, after 10 reps, and I'm pretty physically fit, after 10 reps, I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm feeling the tingling. I'm, you know, I'm feeling something. So I think you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Even without weights. Mm -hmm. So Marsha has a question, but she also had a comment. She said, so refreshing to hear that all muscles and bones are connected. And her question is, but why do specialists segment our spine when we have pain only dealing with specific segments? Could learn a that lot of you. Beautiful question, Marsha. Oh my goodness. So thank you so much for bringing that up. So the spine, and actually let me get Betty Bones over here. I, I, oh, sorry. she has a name for Betty. Bones. Betty Bones. <laughs> How cute. <laughs> so this, this, is, this is Betty Bones. Okay. She, she says hello. And you can see here the spine. Let me turn it sideways. So you can see the curves in the spine, right? So the neck, the bones curve in. The trunk, the bones curve out a little bit. Then the low back, they curve in. And then the sacrum, it curves out. So you have these curves in your spine which makes your spine eight times stronger than it would be if there were no curves. So we, we wanna maintain those curves. We don't want them to be excessive and we don't want them to be uh, impaired, right? Or lessened. Now, the reason they segment it, right? Your neck is cervical, the trunk is thoracic, low back is lumbar, and the pelvis is sacral. The reason they call it different names is because there's a different curve. The, the size and shape of the vertebrae are a little bit different how they stack on each other is different. So your cervical spine, it's stacking at about a 45 degree angle. The thoracic spine stacks at about a 60 degree angle. Lumbar stacks at about a 90 degree angle. And the lumbar, because it's the bottom of the spine and it's the weight bearing portion, those vertebrae are really big and very, very strong, right? Your low back can be the strongest link in your body if you feed it from above and below with exercise. So, um, but they, but they, there's no, there's no line in between lumbar and thoracic and cervical 
where, I mean, it's all connected from your skull to your tailbone. It's one piece of anatomy. It's your spine, right? And I, and I've had, I'll tell you, whenever I have somebody in the clinic, if I'm assessing them manually, although for the most part now, I just work with people on zoom. I've been doing it for years long before the world shut down because I can teach them how to fix themselves. And I'd rather have them not be dependent on me and empower them with knowledge and training tools so that they know what to do. But, but you, 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 you can't separate. I mean, I had a woman who had back pain um, whenever she sat, no matter what she did. Well, we got the back pain down to the point where she could watch movies. She could um, sit and, and she could do anything she wanted, but she still had back pain when she sat at the dinner table. So, I'm, you know, me, I'm, everybody's a puzzle, right? Everybody's unique, like a fingerprint. So I'm pretending I'm sitting at the table and I look down at my food and I go, ah, her neck. We, we, we addressed the neck. There was a, she had no neck pain. But when she looked down, when she was sitting, she had back pain because the neck had a limitation and because the OA joint was locked and it wasn't providing the motion, she got this abnormal pull in her low back when she looked down. So you, you, you are not a body part. You're not a neck or a trunk or a lumbar that walks through the door. Everything's connected. And, and, but it's because of the, the different shapes and sizes and how things line up, but every different part of the spine also has different mobility. Your, your, your neck is the most mobile, right? It's not really all that weight bearing except for your head and maybe how many brains you've got. If you're really smart, it might be heavier, but, um, but the trunk, the trunk is, you know, that's, you want full mobility in the trunk, the lumbar spine, it's strength is just bending forward and back. It's not really good at rotating or side bending because the trunk is supposed to do that. And the hips are supposed to do that. So if you got low back pain, when you twist, it's probably not your lumbar spine because its job isn't to rotate. So if there's pain, it's being pulled because your trunk's not rotating or your hips aren't rotating. So you have to look above and below. So, but that was a great question because no, you, you, you are not. Yeah. I, I get so frustrated when they do that, when they split up the spine. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Well, I really am looking forward to you going downstairs and, and uh, showing us some things that we can do yeah. at home. So we're going to let you do that. And yeah. And I'm going to take you off the screen. I'll put you on the screen a little bit from. Uh, All right. I'll have, Betty, I'll have Betty keep yeah, she's gonna... <laughs> Okay. So we're waiting for Eileen. She's going to go downstairs and she has a camera set up there that we're going to put on pretty soon. And when she does that, we'll add her back onto the stream. And please, if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll be happy to put them up for you. And I'm curious to see if you are on a plant-based lifestyle, just say yes, if you are. And also, if you like to exercise, say, tell, tell us what kind of exercise do you do? Well, we're going to take a peek to see if she made it downstairs yet. So let's just take a peek and see. Oh, she's not there yet, but I'm sure she will be soon. So an, an, another thing that I wanted to tell you guys is that because today we're, we're doing this in the new year and I wanted to offer all of you guys uh, five free recipes that I will send to you. So all you have to do is go to begreenwithamy.com slash join and I will send you every other day another recipe and plus some things that I like to do when I'm exercising and so forth. And it looks like Eileen's downstairs. You made it there. Okay. I am. I'm so here. You oh, let me make this a little bit bigger so I can see what you're saying here. Yes. And we'll, we'll put you full screen so everybody can see there we go. what you're doing. Excellent. Okay. So you can see me okay. I want everybody to be yeah. able to see all of me. So yes. as long as I don't step into something. Okay. So what, as you learned, it's ankles, hips, and trunk, right? So obviously this isn't going to be a whole workout class. What I'm going to do is teach you a couple of ways to train those different body parts so that you can kind of assess and, and test yourself and see what's going on. And, and you might be really shocked. Oh my gosh, that's right. I sprained that ankle back in college and no wonder my knee is, is not happy. My ankle's not working right. Right. So what your what your foot and I'll start from the ground up because everything happens when the feet hit the ground. So everything changes, I should say. So what you want your foot to be able to do is to dorsiflex really well. So dorsiflexion is when your toes come closer to your shin. Okay. Or if you're on the ground, your shin comes closer to your toes, right? Either way, that's dorsiflexion. 
when you're walking, when I go to when I go to change, when I when this leg swings forward, that's dorsiflexion. And and if I don't have that, I'm going to walk kind of flat footed. Right. I had this gentleman who had neck pain and headaches in the morning um, and he loved to walk in the morning. He didn't want to give it up. It was his favorite thing. And we figured out he, he had like nine conventional PT visits and his therapist was on vacation. So he ended up on my schedule and I could see nothing had changed and they were doing range of motion and ultrasound and heat and it was all useless. It didn't do a bit of good for him. And I don't understand how if you've got neck pain, turning your head is going to fix it. It, it. To me, that's just not logical, but that's an aside. So I asked him, I said, because I know how everything happens when you're walking, you've got to have good ankle motion. So I said, have you ever sprained your ankles? And he said, constantly in college, he had no dorsiflexion. So I did some gentle moves. I gave him some very effective stretches. That one session cured his neck pain and headaches when he walked. He never had to come back to PT. So they could have been treating his neck for 30 years. Wouldn't have done any good, right? Because the problem was here. So you've really got to make sure your ankles are working well. So dorsiflexion. So what you want to do, let's see here. I'll show you as I spin around here and look like I don't know what I'm doing. So Hold on to something. You can hold on to the wall, but I don't want to have my back to you. You can hold on to the wall or you can hold on to a kitchen counter or the top of a chair. And what you want to do is put one foot back. And now when that foot is back, you want to make sure the heel is down and the knee is straight, right? And that the toes are pointed forward. If your foot's turned out, that's not dorsiflexion. So you want to make sure that foot is forward. And what you're going to do is you're going to rock your hips forward. Now, you might feel if you've got really tight hip flexors because of sitting for decades, you might feel some restriction in the front of that hip. So, you know, don't hurt yourself. The goal here, you're not, you know, punching the bear in the nose with every repetition, right? You want to kind of cozy up to the bear and make him happy you're there, okay? So you're going to just, just kind of come forward inchworm, but you want to keep the heel down. If the heel keeps coming up or if your knee wants to bend, you're lacking dorsiflexion, right? So... Hips forward, but notice my head and shoulders stay back. If I come forward like this, I'm not really getting what I want. So just kind of rock forward and you want dynamic loading, which means you want to load and unload, load and unload. Because when we, we're, we're dynamic human beings, we move, right? We don't take a pose when we're walking down the road and wait 30 seconds before we take the next step. You've got to be able to load and unload. So this is, this is a beautiful thing to do. It's going to improve your dorsiflexion. Now, you remember from the pictures, we talked about eversion, inversion. That's when the heel goes side to side. So what you want to do there is you want to come forward to load it first. And then you're going to do kind of like you've got parallel bars and you're going to tap them with your hips. You want that side to side movement. And that's going to give you that eversion, inversion of the heel right? But you want to come forward and load it first and do that nice side to side. Now, again, you might feel that in the front of the hip. So you might be really limited there. Don't do anything that causes pain. If you're forcing pain on yourself when you're trying to restore something, what's happening is, is your brain thinks that you're not smart enough to protect yourself. So your brain figures out a way to cheat and it uses all the wrong muscles and all the wrong pathways in order to accomplish what you're trying to do. And you think you're getting better at it, but basically your body's cheating and you're training in dysfunction. So forcing pain repetitively on your body is not going to make things better. If anything, it makes it worse. Okay. So hopefully I'm clear there. So you're going to come forward, you're going to load, and you're going to do side to side. Now, if one side causes some pain, don't do that side. If it doesn't feel good to go right with your hips, then just go left with your hips. Eventually, you'll notice after a few days, you'll be like, oh, I can do both sides now because you're, you're building on success. You're not trying to force things you can't do. And then the last thing for the ankles, there are three planes of motion, right? So going just forward, that's one plane. Going side to side is another plane. Now we're gonna add rotation. So you're gonna come forward and you're gonna rotate. Now, when you rotate, just let your whole body turn, even use your head and your eyes because your body will follow where your eyes go. So you're gonna get a beautiful load on that foot, ankle, calf complex like you've probably never done before. So if you're somebody who has discomfort when you walk or those kind of things, 
or maybe you've got discomfort um, going downstairs that requires full calf mobility. A lot of people don't realize it. They'll have knee pain going downstairs, but it's not their knee, it's their calf that's not functioning properly. So this is gonna get that calf muscle to get longer under tension and control the movement as you're going down the stairs. That also requires good quad as well. But for the most part, a lot of people have knee pain going downstairs because their calf, their ankles limited. So that is a really good way to do that. Now, when it comes to hips, there's a lot that can be done for hips. Like I said, it's the second most mobile joint in the body. Your shoulders are the most mobile, right? Now I can't quite do that with my leg, but I've got, a, a, you know, you, you've got good, you know, internal and external rotation and abduction and adduction and flexion and extension, right? Your hip is very mobile, or at least it's supposed to be. Your hip might not be mobile. And then it doesn't really matter how mobile it is when you're not weight bearing, right? It doesn't really matter if I can kick all the way out to the side. Can that motion control me going like that, right? That's weight-bearing abduction. That matters more. What's weight-bearing adduction, right? Can I cross over and weight-bear and keep myself stable? You know, can I flex in weight-bearing and come all the way down and be nice and stable? Nine times out of 10, when I test this on people, they're all unstable and they're all over the place and they can't believe how unstable they are. It's because their hamstrings are not controlling the motion. And, and a lot of people say, oh, but my hamstrings have always been so tight. No, they're probably taut. You're unstable and your hamstrings are trying to keep you stable like the reins on a horse. So stretching them just makes you more unstable or increases your risk of injury. So you want to improve stability and your hamstrings will relax. So, so there's a lot of things that people are very, you know, really misunderstand. So when it comes to hips, there are, you know, there's all kinds of motions you can do because you want outer and front and back and inner hip. You want everything working really well. A very, um, the most important, well, well they're all important. And I'm, I'm trying to keep this where I'm not teaching you 14 things. The most important things probably is making sure the back hip and the front hip are really working well. And so the, the front hip if you wanna do a nice motion, and we could do toe tapping. I think that's a really good start for people. So if I go to tap forward and I lean back a little bit, notice I'm holding on, I want you to hold on if you're not used to this. If you don't have to hold on, that's fine, but you don't want your body to cheat, right? So if you hold on, so if I tap with my right toes and I lean back a little bit, I'm loading the front of that hip. You might notice after doing that about 10 or 15 times, wow, my hip really starts to feel a little fatigued, right? Because you're loading that hip flexor and the abs, they're working together, they're back on the phone, communicating. And, and so that's gonna really help the front of that hip to, to, to work well. And then you can advance it, you can start stepping forward, you can put arms up, you can make it harder, you can progress it, but that's a great place to start. And of course you wanna do it on both sides. And then if you do a toe tap behind you, now, when you go backward and you kind of lean forward a little, if you're old enough to remember those little glass birds that used to sit on the dash of the car and they'd bob, I had, I had one of my patients call this the, the drinking bird exercise. So what you do is you just tap behind you and now the back hip is working to keep me safe, right? It's loading and unloading, loading and unloading. And you want to make sure you completely come out of the load so that you're, you're training the body. You get this repetitive sort of like a, a hydration effect, right? A fluid fill effect, a pumping mechanism. So that if it doesn't know how to work right, it learns how to again, like it was designed to do. And then we could do outer hip. So outer hip would be if you cross over. So again, hold on and just cross over and you wanna feel that hip on the side of the leg that's not moving, kind of comes up a little bit. You don't wanna force it to exaggerate, but you do wanna feel it come up a little because now you're loading the outer hip and you come back and completely unload and load and unload, right? And then if you wanna load the inner hip, that would be stepping out. And I'm holding because I wanna make sure you hold. You wanna step out and now that's loading inner hip. And you can see I'm kind of leaning into it. Now, when I say loading, that's because the muscle is getting longer and controlling the movement once it's been initiated. It's a physics thing also. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You cannot isolate a muscle. 
no matter what anyone has ever told you, you cannot isolate a muscle because whenever you're working a muscle, there's whole other body parts that are working in, in an opposite reaction to that in order for it to happen. You can't get up off a chair unless you're pushing your feet through the floor. You won't go anywhere if you don't push your feet into the floor. That's the equal and opposite reaction. Enough reaction to lift your body weight is pushing through the floor with your feet. It's the same with any other exercise you do, right? And isolating muscles is a very bad thing to do because now you're trying to force a body part to do work that it's supposed to have help with. And, and we've all been taught, oh, but that's cheating. No, that's how your body's designed to work. If I go to pick up a bag of groceries off the table, and yeah, I'm going to use my biceps, but I'm also going to, I'm going to lean down. I'm going to squat a little bit. It's a heavy bag. I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to push through the floor with my feet as I lift it. My biceps will be doing some of the work. Yes, but the rest of my body's also working. But if I go to, if I go to take a weight and all I'm going to do is, you know, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to isolate that bicep. I'm going to keep that elbow in and I'm going to supinate and I'm going to come up and I'm not going to let any other body part do anything. Well, guess what you're doing? You're setting yourself up for tendonitis. Because your, your bicep is saying, why aren't you letting anybody else work with me? Why am I having to do this all by myself? That's not natural. That's not authentic function. So think about what you do in real life, right? And I don't want to get off on a tangent, but if you're in a gym and you're doing movements that are not authentic and you would never do it in real life, why are you doing it in the gym against resistance repetitively? You're just setting yourself up for injury, right? Okay. And, and I worked with a lot of people who went to the gym five days a week and they wondered why they had tendonitis. Well, I, I was there to tell them. Last thing, that was hips, trunk. You want to make sure that your trunk is fully mobile. And it's, it can be as easy as just, a, a, um, just, just movement, just doing the movement, keeping your feet side by side, right? And if you cross your arms, you can kind of come down. And the goal here is to sort of to sort of crunch your elbows into your waist and get a nice sort of a hunchback. And then when you come up, lift your chest to the ceiling. So you're lifting your ribs up and your head and shoulders come back. That's gonna give you a nice extension. And then you wanna do some side bending. When I do the side bending, it's not about bending down to the floor. It's I'm feeling my ribs kind of do a side glide, right? So I side bend and I kind of feel my ribs sort of go that way and go that way. And then of course, rotation, that's the easiest of all, right? How far can you rotate? And you wanna really try to, try to get as far as you can. If you notice you can rotate a lot further to one side than the other, you've got a serious asymmetry going on. And I don't mean serious like you're in trouble. I just mean that your body's going to be compensating. Your brain's not telling you, guess what? You don't rotate left very well. So whenever you go to turn that way, I've got to use all these other muscles because your trunk doesn't do it. Your brain doesn't tell you you're compensating. Your brain keeps it all a secret. And you're completely unaware you're doing it. And so it builds up those compensatory patterns you end up with chronic pain and issues. But if you train and you make sure that your foot ankle calf complex is fully mobile and stable, you make sure your hips are fully mobile and stable, and you make sure your trunk is fully mobile, the odds are in your favor that you won't deal with chronic pain and you will not age with decline. So hopefully that, uh, that was helpful. And I'm here to answer any questions if there's any. Oh, I'm not hearing you. Are you muted? I think that I there think you are I'm on. Am I okay? Yeah, well, that was wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. I think we had a couple more questions. Let's just see. Um, Jennifer want to know: Are there any exercises to avoid or help relieve knee pain? I'm sorry. To avoid or help what? Or help to relieve knee pain. Oh, help to relieve knee pain. So as I said earlier, knees are, you know, now if you've got bone on bone, that's, you know, the bone is rubbing and that's, that's kind of a hard thing to, to deal with. Um, but if that's not the case and you don't have any serious um, structural stuff going on in there, um, and a quick aside, a lot of the time stuff will show up on imaging, but that's not the reason you've got the knee pain. It's because the hip's not working, the ankle's not working. So you don't want to beat up the knee. The knee is the victim. It's not the culprit. 
So I've had lots of people with knee issues where we make sure they're training their ankles properly. We make sure they're training their hips properly and the knees stop hurting. So um, I, I do have a I have a, a free membership to the Move Without Pain private club, and you can go on there, and there's a 21-minute video that teaches you how to assess your three-plane function. There's even a document you can download and fill it out as in, you know, document your findings. And then there's a, a movement video that introduces to three-plane function with, I think, about a half a dozen or so exercises on there, and I teach modifications. Um, I've seen a lot of people, they've really been able to get their pain greatly improved just by doing that free class. So that might help. Oh, excellent. I think we're just going to have one more question. We have a lot of questions. So we're going to have to have you come back. I mean, yes. There's a lot of interest in what you're talking about. So Anne wanted to know, she said, I bend down like for the dishwasher. I get pain just above my waist. Happens also when I walk. What could that be? Thanks. Okay. So pain, ju pain just above her waist. Did I hear yeah. that right? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, I would never, ever attempt to diagnose anybody or fix them, uh, you know, without seeing them and, and seeing what's going on. I can just speak generally as to some potential causes, right? So when we're bending down, a lot of the times what's happening is when you go to bend down, your, your gluteus maximus, right? Max, max is going to really provide a lot of stability. Max is your power source. So if max is weak, if somebody has what I lovingly call a pancake butt, um, they don't have a power source. So you've got to have a power source. If you're if you're bending down to squat and you don't have a power source, your your low back can can be right, and that's that's just above the waist, right? Um, everything happens if that that power source really has to support and provide. I mean, I could hang out here for an hour, right? But but you've got to have that that power there. Okay. Um, another reason could be, I'm trying to think, she said some, it was bending for the dishwasher and just standing. Also, was that the other thing? You know, also when she walks. Walking. Okay. So walking, depending, a lot of the times people will walk with their hands in their pocket. So they'll have their arms folded. You want your arms hanging and you want a nice swing of your trunk. Right. And I was just working with somebody today who who she kind of, because she has her anatomy, she's very large chested and she's trying to hide her chest. So she kind of does this, this crunch thing, right? You don't want to stand up straight if you've got a big chest, which is our society's a mess with that. But I won't get off on that tangent. So she's, she's like this. So she's all hunched forward when she's walking. Well, guess what happens when you're all hunched forward when you're walking? You're not walking properly. So you want to make sure you're, you, you kind of lift your chest and you can practice this at home so that you don't feel like you look foolish when you're out, but kind of exaggerate the rotation of your trunk, right? So I've listed, lifted my chest up to, to take the stress off my spine, which improves all those curves that I showed you on Betty Bones. When those curves are, are better, everything's better. There's less stress on anything. And when you rotate, your trunk will help your legs to swing forward. So there's less work. So walking actually becomes effortless effort. So um, hopefully that's helpful. Yes, yeah, she said, yep. Chest issues, true for me too. <laughs> it's like, yeah, like, yeah. Like, and, and, like, and that's like, terrible, like, right? But nobody's, <laughs> and, and I just want to say this, you know, as a female, right? We don't, you know, we, we kind of get shamed into, you know, oh, you're showing off your goods, right? That couldn't be further from the truth. And, and what it is, is you're providing a good, nice, stable spine and supporting your body properly. And, and doing this doesn't hide the size of our chest. The size of our chest is the size of our chest, no matter what our posture is. Right. So so lifting chest up and it's not about, oh, you know, you're not walking around trying to, you know, to lead with your chest. But the goal is to make sure that you've got that upright. It's the up toward the ceiling thing and then a nice rotation. And, you know, you're not going to walk outside like this. Practice around the house. And then when you get outside, you're going to automatically do a beautiful arm swing. When I assess people's gait in the clinic, if they don't have an arm swing, Oh my gosh, there's the, I know their trunk is just frozen, right? So that's just so amazing. It's like you're psychic when you knew about it <laughs> with the chest. And, and you're right, there's just so many things that we need to learn. I'm so glad that you did this presentation today. 
And yes, I thank you. we are going to have to have you back because everybody wants to see you come back and give us some more information. And I just want to thank you so much for teaching us that decline is, is not necessarily inevitable because of aging, right? I mean, you shared so many very helpful tips of how we can authentically train our body. I love that by building on success. And Yes. And that's what it's all about. And I yes. I exercise a lot and I learn things from you because I follow along on videos and things online and, and about isolating muscles. So I'm going to definitely take a lot of what you offered into account when I'm doing these things from now on. Everybody, please click like because that's how we applaud online to show your appreciation for what Eileen shared with us today. And Eileen, well, tell us about what you do and how we can find you and, and all that good stuff. Uh, well, I, I mainly work with people online now. I do a lot of online programs and trainings. That is my, my passion now is to empower people to be able to fix themselves. I, I have a lot of manual skills, but you know, when the world shut down, those weren't possible to be used. I'd already been trained in a lot of methods that people could learn. And what I've sort of done is fine tuned um, what's called applied functional science that I'm certified in through the Gray Institute. They only teach professionals. They don't teach the layperson. And so I was like, the public needs to know this stuff. So I started teaching this stuff. I teach it at the local community college. I created online programs and people eat it up with a spoon. So um, so I've got the Move Without Pain Private Club, which has a free membership and a, and a paid membership. Um, I've got my boot camp starting at the 30th. I'm always doing events about at least every other month. I'm doing a big free event. I have my YouTube channel. I've got a lot of movement education on there. I do a monthly newsletter. I've got a Friday value video that goes out every Friday, um, which is like three to four minutes of some valuable tip that people may not know. So I do my best. I'm, you know, my goal is to erase pain from the world. And I know I need a really big eraser, but, uh, but I'm working on it. So. Well, beautiful. I'm glad that you're here to, to do some erasing. And I, I think that you did a lot. You're getting a lot of great feedback here about people who have helped you. And I wanted to tell the green warriors that are watching and listening, tell us what you're going to remember and in your take, what's your takeaway, type that in your comments. And please stay tuned for a special announcement. I did want to thank Just Has Voice because she did the promos and the voiceover. And Just Has Voice, tell us who's coming up next. Since 2020, Delaney, age 21, lost over 150 pounds. Learn about dealing with food addiction and hear Delaney Zinn's powerful journey on Wednesday, January 11th, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific on Be Green with Amy Live. Well, most of all, I want to thank all of you that keep coming back and watching and listening and sharing because without you, we wouldn't be here. And it's so rewarding to see the guests that we have today, Eileen, that she was able to help you with some of the struggles that you're having and help you to learn that you can age without decline. It's so exciting. And I'm hoping to have her back really soon. But please go ahead and take your right hand and grab your left shoulder and take your left hand and grab your right shoulder because this is my squeeze, squeeze it. That's a hug from me to you. And if you want to join, you can comment my tagline, be strong, be well, and be green. Are you ready? Eileen, I'm ready. Sign off with that. Okay, here we go. Well, until I see you guys again, remember, be strong, be well, and be green. green. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, Eileen. Thank you, Amy. Now you can listen to Be Green with Amy expert interviews wherever you go. Listen while walking, meal prepping, or traveling. Find Be Green with Amy on Apple, Google, Alexa, Amazon, or virtually anywhere you find podcasts. Be strong, be well, and be green with Be Green with Amy.